Well, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Vicky St. Clair and today's webcast on data visualization is presented by Josh Yasmin and sponsored by Aquant Federal. Aquant's worked with some of the biggest and best industry brands for more than 30 years and Aquant Federal specializes in partnering with government agencies. We have a lot to talk about here today, so let me introduce our guest speaker. He is Josh Yasmin, currently a data analyst with the Slate Group in Washington, DC. Want to shut that forward, Josh? Uh, sure. There we go, one more. And I'm not gonna read all of that out, but he currently works with the Slate Group in Washington, DC. And in addition to working and studying for his master's, you can tell he's really busy, uh, Josh is also advocacy chair for the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network in the DC area. So we really appreciate you being with us, Josh, and sharing your expertise today. Welcome, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Let's jump straight on in. All right, thanks. Um, so like, uh, like Vicky said, my name is Josh. Uh, I sort of got into uh, data analysis work um, a, a few years ago by going out and generating a lot of data. I was working for political campaigns in Virginia and uh, going and knocking on doors, talking to voters about uh, who they supported in various elections and why I thought they should support my candidate. And then uh, every conversation I had, I would record that on uh, a clipboard and then go home at night and put that information into a computer and uh, somebody would do something with it, and then the next day they would give me another list of people to go talk to. So I got really interested in how those lists were generated um, and started digging a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper. Uh, and over the last few years, uh, I've been able to sort of um, unpack that process and, and learn a lot about it, and it, it's something that's really interesting to me. It's why I got into data analysis. Um, so one, one key part of data analysis that uh, we're gonna talk about today is, uh, is data visualization. Um, so we're gonna cover a couple of different topics in data visualization today. Uh, first, we're gonna talk about uh, the difference between graphs, infographics, and dashboards. Um, there are some, some nuanced differences between these three uh, sort of methods of communicating data. Um, and we're gonna talk about what, that, uh, what each of those things is and how it can be useful. Um, and then we're going to dive into uh, ways to communicate your data. So uh, we're going to talk about matching the, the type of data you have to the right visualization, um, starting with figuring out what type of data you do have. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit towards the end about uh, some pitfalls in data visualization, some things to avoid, uh, and then some best practices, some ways to uh, make your data visualization better. So let's dive in. So uh, first, we'll talk about graphs. Um, when I think of a graph, I think of a single uh, data visualization, so a, a single chart or graph communicating some piece of information. Um, this graph here is looking at um, our, uh, our membership rates versus the, the number of times someone's read uh, a piece on our website. Um, so this is communicating one piece of information. We're looking at the intersection of uh, you know, how, how often someone has to read to, uh, to become interested in subscribing uh, and, you know, paying us a monthly fee to, to access our content. Um, and, and it's all, you know, presented there visually, but it's one thing. Um, moving on from that, we have uh, a dashboard, which is a, a collection of graphs that uh, come together to tell a story. Uh, dashboards are typically really good for uh, interactive data visualizations. So uh, data visuals where you can uh, sort of click around and uh, adjust what you're looking at and sort of customize your own analysis. Um, and they're also good for data that updates daily. So uh, I'm gonna actually leave this PowerPoint and click over to, uh, to a live version of this dashboard um, just to demonstrate some of that interactivity. Um, so we've got four charts here. Uh, we've got a statewide elections map from 2016. Uh, we've got those results mapped on county level over to the right. Uh, and then on the bottom here, we have a map of uh, county level data. It's a, a scatter plot of county level data that shows where uh, the 2016 candidates overperformed or underperformed uh, their 2012 counterparts. So we have some annotations here that say uh, above this diagonal line here, Hillary Clinton overperformed. 
And if you scroll over a county, there's some uh, demographic information from the census. Um, and then similarly over here, we have that same data for Trump compared to, to Romney. Uh, and then the, the real interactivity part is that you can click around this, uh, this dashboard and uh, I'm from Virginia, so I, I wanna look a little bit more into, uh, into Virginia data. So I clicked on Virginia and zoomed in uh, to only Virginia counties on this map over here and, uh, and, and on the scatter plots down here. Um, I'm also going to adjust this and look at only counties with a below average white population. Um, and and uh, you know, without editorializing uh, about the data itself, I, I wanna demonstrate that um, this data tells a story. We're, we're looking at um, sort of where each candidate performed better than they were expected to uh, or better than their party would be expected to. Um, and we're sort of combining several visuals to do that. And then there's an interactivity uh, element. Um, this dashboard does not update daily like many do. Um, that's because the 2016 election results are no longer updating. Uh, they're all certified. So uh, the data itself is static in this case, but uh, a lot of times you'll you'll see a uh, like a daily report formatted as a dashboard. Um, so, and back to the the PowerPoint. The last uh, the last type of uh, graph we're going to talk about is an infographic. Uh, so an infographic is similar to a dashboard, um, except these are typically static. Um, a lot of times you'll see posters formatted as infographics. Uh, if you work with um, like scientists, a lot of times uh, scientific research will be formatted as a poster with uh, you know with charts and graphs intermingled with uh, more qualitative verbal uh, or text information. So the example we have here from the USDA, uh, we've got some information on a food waste program that they're they're running, uh, and we do have some some data visualizations. We've got this uh, nifty little clock down here that uh, shows some data. We've got these uh, pie charts here, uh, but we've also got pictures that illustrate what we're talking about, like these two kids playing with a ball. Uh, and we've got a lot of text uh, as well. Uh, the back of that truck is all, uh, all made up of text. So uh, infographics are, are sort of similar to dashboards in that they bring a lot of different visuals together to tell a story, but they're, they tend to be more static uh, a lot of times an infographic will be uh, very long, uh, whereas a dashboard should theoretically fit on one screen without having to do a ton of scrolling. But uh, the commonality is that they're, they're both a collection of visual communications of data that tell a story. So uh, before we move on to data types, just to review that, we've got graphs, which are a single uh, instance of communications. We've got a dashboard that is a, a dynamic collection of graphs that changes either on some fixed schedule when you update the data or in some interactive way where the user can limit the amount of data they're looking at or, or change the data they're looking at to customize their analysis. And then we've got infographics, which are also a, a collection of graphs and uh, data points that come together to tell a story. Yeah. So moving on to data types, there are two main types of data. We've got discrete data and categorical. When we're talking about discrete data, we're talking about values that can uh, only hold uh, certain formats. So uh, on a survey, you might be able to, uh, if, you, if you take an online survey, you might be able to enter your gender as male, female, other, or prefer not to say. So those are four options for what you can list as your gender on that survey. You can't necessarily say I'm 55% male, 20% female, 15% other, and 10% uh, prefer not to say. There's not that, uh, there, there's not a continuum. You're, you're picking an, a category to be in. Uh, another word for, category, for discrete data is categorical data because it's data talking about categories of things. Uh, you're, you're in uh, one group or the other. Um, discrete data is typically data that we can't immediately do math with. 
So you can't say uh, a male plus a female equals seven. Uh, you, you have to either assign some value to, uh, to those discrete variables um, or uh, use them as a way to segment your data without necessarily uh, doing math on that value itself. Um, some examples of this, uh, I, like I just mentioned, we have gender. Uh, you can be male or female or other, um, but at, at least when talking about you know, survey data or, or, or most structured data, it's going to uh, you're going to be really hard pressed to find uh, gender presented as anything other than uh, uh, a categorical value. Um, some other examples we've got government agencies. Uh, which government agency you work for is a a categorical data, uh, a categorical data point. Um, so you probably work for the State Department or the Justice Department uh, or the, uh, you know, somewhere else in the executive branch, but you're, uh, very few people are, are uh, working on some continuum of, uh, of agency. Um, and then the last example here, and keep this in mind for the next slide, is age. Uh, so age can be either discrete or categorical, depending on how we treat it. Uh, age can be discrete if you want to say that uh, one person is 30 years old and this other person is 29 years old and therefore they're different. Uh, you'll also see uh, oftentimes on surveys the results will be reported as uh, you know 18 to 29 year olds think uh, think this, 30 to 39 year olds think this, 40 to 49 year olds think this other thing. Um, so th that's a way of using age as a discrete value. Uh, continuous data can have any uh, any value on some range. So uh, you can um, you can do math with continuous data where you couldn't do math with discrete data. Uh, you can say that uh, someone makes you know, seventy thousand dollars, uh, and then the next person uh, makes seventy thousand and one dollars, and the next person after them makes seventy thousand and two dollars. Um, there's a continuum of values that salary can take, uh, not just some uh, bucket. Uh, so another example of continuous data is the score in a football game. So we can say Virginia Tech scored 28 points today, and, and last week they scored uh, 27 points, and the week before they scored 26 points. Um, and then going back to age, uh, age can also be a continuous data set because uh, someone who's 40 years old is 10 years older than someone who's 30 years old. Uh, so data can take the form of either being discrete or continuous um, depending on the, the data itself uh, and also how you're using it. So if you want to do math with a numerical value, you can absolutely do that. If you don't want to do math with a numerical value, you can treat it uh, as a discrete data point. Uh, there are some, some uh, statistical caveats that go with that, but those are sort of beyond the, the scope of this conversation. But when you're thinking about your data, think about uh, the, the instant gut check that I use is, can I do math with this piece of information? And if, if the answer to that question is no, then that piece of information is almost definitely discrete. Uh, if the answer to that question is yes, then it's probably continuous. So let's now talk about uh, the, the different types of charts that you can use with uh, discrete and categorical uh, variables. And we're gonna talk about these charts in terms of uh, the type of data that you have and also the number of variables you're using of that type. So keep that in mind for the next couple of slides. So we'll start off with bar charts. I think everyone has probably seen a bar chart at some point in their careers. Um, the, the bar, there's one bar for each category of a, uh, of a categorical variable. Um, this bar chart here that we have as an example is gender, uh, the, the responses to a, a, a gender question on a pre-election survey from 2016. So a group of researchers called a thousand people and uh, one of the questions they asked was, what is your gender? Around 52% of people said female, 48% of people said male. Uh, there was some, some st uh, statistical weighting involved in that, but we come out with this distribution that says uh, the, the bar for female should be slightly longer than the bar for male because 
slightly more people were female in that survey. Um, so the, the length of the bar in a bar chart uh, corresponds to uh, whatever value you're measuring from that category. Uh, and then the, the last sort of distinguishing point I'll, I'll point out about bar charts is that there is a gap between the bars that illustrates the, uh, the disconnect between those two categories. So uh, remember we were talking about discrete variables, you can be male or female on a survey. Uh, so in this case, there's a, a little gap between the bar for male and the bar for female that illustrates visually the, the sense that everyone falls into one of these two buckets. There's no in between. So bar charts are really good for uh, when you have one discrete variable to, to present. In this case, our, our one discrete variable was gender. Moving on to histograms, uh, histograms are good for one continuous variable. Uh, so similar to bar charts, we break up our continuous variable into, uh, into some set of values. Uh, in this case, I, I think there are 30 bars on, uh, on this continuum here. So uh, each bar represents 1 30th of the possible uh, score outcomes of a basketball game. And the length of the bar corresponds with the number of, uh, of games that fall into that set of values. So uh, looking at this, we can say that uh, this, this is taken from uh, a data set of college basketball games played in the first quarter of the year uh, between 2011 and 2016. Uh, this data is taken from sportsreference.com to make sure I cite my sources. Um, and what we're looking at here is that there are very few games where the combined score is under 100 points. And then you get more and more and more games uh, where the combined score is between 100 and say 140 points. Uh, if we're watching a college basketball game, it makes perfect sense for, um, for each team to score around 70 points. Uh, and then uh, getting up over 70 points uh, per team or, or uh, about 100, 120, 130 points here, uh, these outcomes start getting more and more rare. And it's just incredibly rare to have a game where both teams score over 100 points or, or one team uh, scores like 150 points and the other team scores 60 points. Um, so we're looking at the, uh, the number of times various outcomes on a continuous variable happen. Uh, one thing that's particularly helpful with histograms. Uh, the thing that I probably use histograms the most for is to determine uh, the distribution of a continuous variable. So this gets important if you're, uh, if someone hands you a, a report and says the average income of Kentucky is uh, $40,000 uh, or the, the average income of Kentucky is maybe, you know, $55,000. Uh, if you map, uh, if you put everyone's income, income in Kentucky on a histogram, it wouldn't look like this nice uh, sort of bell curve here. It would, uh, it would go up and up and up at the very beginning and then uh, back down and, and sort of tail off towards the, the higher end where there, there are very, very few um, high incomes. This is true uh, in, in pretty much any geographic area you look most people's incomes are, are going to be on the lower end. Um, so if you, if most people's income are on the lower end and, uh, but a few really, really high earners are included uh, in the data that you're looking at, the average income is going to be skewed higher than, uh, than the reality on the ground is. Uh, a great way of explaining this that I, that I heard is uh, I'll, I'll bet the average income of people watching uh, watching this webinar is maybe somewhere around seventy thousand dollars, and uh, but if Bill Gates tunes into this webinar, uh, Bill Gates is worth something like forty billion dollars. So uh, adding Bill Gates into our data set um, and, and taking the sum of all of our salaries and dividing it by the number of people watching this uh, would would make us all millionaires. So it would mean that the average income of people watching this webinar is well over a million dollars. Um, when that's not really reflective of reality. Uh, in those cases where the data is very skewed 
either towards the lower end of a distribution like that or the higher end like that. Um, the, the simplest thing to do with your data is to make sure you're calculating a median instead of, uh, instead of the average. So instead of adding, adding every value and dividing by the number of values, you put all your values in order and take the middle one. So that was a little, a little statistical, uh, a little statistical digression, but uh, that that is what I use histograms most for: is to uh, make sure I'm using the right metric to summarize a set of values. Uh, moving on to our next visual, we've got scatter plots. Uh, in the case of a scatter plot, we're looking at two continuous variables, and we're going to put a dot uh, somewhere on this plane that corresponds to each value. So for this, uh, my mouse, this value here that I'm circling here, um, it looks like the score for team A in this basketball game was maybe somewhere around 40. And the score for team B was also maybe somewhere around 40. Uh, but the, the way we, we map this point onto our plot is we, we find the score for team A, and we go over, over, over on the x-axis, and we find the score for team B, we go up and up and up on the y-axis and then put our point there. Uh, and then we step back once we've mapped all of our values and we look for patterns. Uh, there's sort of two ways that I would look at a scatter plot that I, that I look at scatter plots frequently. Is uh, one of them is to divide our plot up into uh, regions. So maybe I decide that the median score of a basketball game is 70 points. So I want to draw a line uh, align through this chart vertically and horizontally at seven po or 70 points, and then look at uh, how many values sort of fall into the top right quadrant up here, where both teams scored a lot of points. Uh, how many values fall into the top left, where Team B scored a lot of points and Team A didn't. Uh, and then continuing down to the bottom left, you've got games where nobody scored a lot of points on the bottom right where team A scored a lot of points and team B didn't. Um, the other way of looking at a scatter plot is to do actual regression analysis, uh, which again is beyond the scope of this talk, but essentially uh, you're doing some math to measure the extent to which uh, this Y value moves uh, when the X value moves. So maybe we have a hypothesis that says, uh, you know, when when one team scores a lot of points in a basketball game, the other team is also going to score a lot of points in a basketball game. So we would expect our, our, our dots here to sort of fall in an upward diagonal pattern, uh, which I guess maybe they kind of do. Uh, it's, it's probably a very loose relationship, but uh, you, know, you can kind of make that argument from looking at this. Uh, and then a, a final thing that scatter plots are good for is, is detecting outliers. So, uh, especially if you're doing a regression analysis, you might have some, some points that, were, uh, that fall way outside of the pattern that you're seeing otherwise. And uh, you want to take a look at those points and see if there was some sort of flaw in the data collection or, uh, or maybe there are just some points in real life that, uh, that contradict the trend that you're seeing. So, uh, one outlier here is this point uh, that I'm circling right now, where it appears Team B scored maybe 85, 90 points, and Team A scored, uh, to be generous, maybe five points. Uh, I don't really believe that that is a basketball score. Uh, I, I don't think a, a team would run up the score like that and, and uh, try to win a game by 80 points. I think probably when, when I pulled this data from sportsreference.com, um, I made a mistake in uh, in my data entry or in, in my in my web scraping, uh, and this uh, the value for team A was was misrecorded. Uh, on the other hand, we've got some values up here that sort of fall out of the general pattern. Uh, so we've got this big blob of of values that seem about right, um, and then we've got a couple up here that um, that that don't. Um, and I would want to look at these. Uh, very carefully and make sure that they were recorded accurately. And if they were, then I'll include them in my analysis. And if they weren't, then I'll, I'll filter them out. So that's a, a third thing you can do with scatter plots. 
Uh, and then one more, uh, one more visual here, one more graph is the line graph. Uh, in this case, we're taking uh, one continuous variable and uh, mapping it against one sequential variable. So uh, a sequence. Uh, the, this is a, a, type of, um, a, a type of continuous variable uh, such as time, or uh, in the case of this example, we've got a lesson number. So this line graph here is uh, the average rating of a set of classes that I taught over, uh, over the course of a, a period of time. So we've got uh, class number one, class number two, class number three, four, five, so on and so forth. But the x-axis here uh, goes in some order. So, uh, and, and then the y-axis is a continuous value that we're uh, measuring over, uh, over that sequence. So a, a, a typical example that I imagine all of you have seen is a stock chart. If you go to invest in, uh, in Uber, uh, you might look at a chart that shows uh, really high stock prices, and then uh, maybe they have some bad press one day and their stock price drops, and then they have some good press the next day and their stock price goes up. Uh, but that price is mapped from, uh, from day to day or from hour to hour, so you can um, sort of evaluate the trend of uh, where you think that stock is going over time. Um, in this case, going back to my, my graph here that I have as an example, uh, these are, are ratings of classes. Um, this dip right here is uh, a, a class presentation day where everyone had to get up in front of the class and present some work that they had been working on the previous three, uh, three courses. So uh, people weren't too happy about that. Uh, but then the, the reviews went up a little bit the next two weeks. Uh, and then they took another dive here. Uh, and then they, uh, they, they sort of leveled out for a little bit and, and really dipped here on class 13. And that was a signal to me that I should go back and look at, uh, you know, look at that class and see what went wrong and where I could improve. Um, and then from there, the reviews sort of started going back up in the right direction towards the end. Um, one other feature I will point out about uh, this example that I think is important for, um, for all graphs is these little up and down, uh, up and down bars that are sticking uh, upward and downward out of uh, each point. And what those represent are uh, the, the margin of error of that estimate. Um, I, uh, one of the things that I sort of evangelize as a data analyst that I think is really important um, is uh, communicating the fact that every, every calculation we make is an estimate on some level. Even if, you're, uh, even if you work for the Census Bureau and you're using the, the decennial census where uh, everyone in America theoretically answers a survey, uh, you're still using uh, some form of estimate with some amount of error because it is, uh, it is practically impossible to interview every single person in America. Uh, this comes up in political polling a lot uh, it, it's, uh, it's too expensive and uh, too time consuming to conduct a census for a political campaign. So, uh, so campaigns go into a state and they, they interview six or 800 people and try to extrapolate general trends from the responses of those six or 800 people. Uh, and every estimate they make uh, about public opinion, about opinion of a candidate, of a, an issue, has some degree of error to it. Uh, I, I think it's, it's paramount as uh, data visualizers that we uh, not only make sure we're calculating that error for our own benefit so that we know, um, we know that our estimate could go uh, in any range of directions. Uh, you know, maybe if, maybe if I had a, a point on here that was sort of close to this, this uh, neutral line but had error bars that went above or below it, uh, it would be really helpful for me to know that there's a, a possibility that that class uh, was negative. And all of these are generally positive, but maybe one class is actually negative. Uh, and it's important to keep that in mind uh, when you're making recommendations based on this data. It's also important uh, to communicate that visually. So 
I, as a data analyst, know that uh, the estimate I made has some, uh, some amount of error to it, some, uh, some amount of variability, but if I show this graph to another person, uh, uh, someone higher up the food chain in, in the company than I am, they might look at it and take it at face value. Um, I want to at least give them that measure of error so that they know that, that they should uh, you know, consider a range of possible outcomes. So uh, in, in summary for this slide, we, we're looking at a line graph. Uh, that is the, the, main, uh, the main function of, of what we're looking at here, where on the x-axis, we've got some sequence of events. A, a lot of times you'll have dates and times. Uh, in this case, I have uh, a, a series of classes that I taught. And then on the y-axis, you've got a, a continuous variable that you're measuring over the course of that sequence. Uh, and then uh, the, the last thing I want to talk about with uh, matching the type of data you have to the right visual is if you have combinations, uh, like complex combinations of data types. So a lot of times, people will try to cram too much information on, onto one chart and end up uh, either muddling their message or uh, sort of overfitting their visual and, and making it more difficult to analyze. I think it's a, a better idea when you have a situation like that to, to make more visuals and just put them next to each other as opposed to uh, trying to add you know, a color element or uh, some other way of, of differentiating data points on the same plot. So the example we have here is uh, the same scatter plot we were looking at with college basketball scores, except now we've limited to games where team A was ranked one through 10. And I wanna see if uh, there's a, a point at which uh, the ranking doesn't necessarily mean you're more likely to beat the other team. So I've got this diagonal line here that indicates a uh, indicates a, an even score. Um, so if a, if a point falls directly on the on the dotted line, that means they tied. Uh, and then below the line means team A won, uh, and above the line means team B won. Um, so we start off with the the games where team A was ranked number one, and uh, the the bulk of these dots are below the dotted line, meaning team A won. The same holds true for when team A is ranked number two and three, uh, four sort of gets a little closer to team B uh, winning more often. Uh, and then once you get down to, team, uh, to ninth ranked teams, um, they're almost losing to, to team B more often than they're winning. Uh, same with 10th ranked teams. Um, so it's a, there are some, some unknowns here. You know, we don't know what the rank of team B is. Uh, maybe all these ninth ranked teams that are losing uh, are playing against first ranked teams or second ranked teams. Um, but the, the, the point of this example is uh, it's better to um, sort of break out these visuals into smaller chunks than to try and uh, cram all of it into one space. So um, just to, to recap, uh, the, the types of visuals we talked about. We talked about a bar chart. When you have one discrete uh, value, we talked about a histogram. When you have one continuous value, a scatter plot for two continuous values, and a line graph for uh, a continuous value with a sequential value. Um, and then uh, again, uh, that, that last point I made was uh, when you have a, a sort of complex set of, of uh, data to present, uh, I think it's better to break that data out into multiple different graphs for people to look at separately. So uh, moving on to pitfalls in, in data visualization. This is uh, the, the pitfalls section and the, uh, the tips section are both uh, not exhaustive lists of, uh, of things that can go wrong or go well with data visualization. These are just sort of the uh, top of mind things that I check for immediately when I when I make a visual. Um, it, there are sort of deeper layers that you can look at uh, what makes a good visual, what makes a bad visual. But I want to give you guys an overview of uh, some of the best things you can do, some of the worst things you can do. 
So uh, we've all heard the, the trope that correlation does not equal causation. Uh, this is uh, when, when correlation is when two variables sort of move together. When, when the variable on the x-axis gets bigger, the variable on the y-axis gets bigger, uh, or maybe when the variable on the x-axis gets smaller, the, the variable on the y-axis gets bigger. Um, but they, they move together in some sort of pattern. Uh, this is what we're looking for in, uh, in regression analysis. Uh, but just because two variables move together doesn't mean that one of them is causing the other. Uh, so my favorite example of correlation and causation is this chart here that uh, I'm including on the slide, uh, demonstrating that the number of people who die by becoming entangled in their bed sheets correlates really well with uh, total revenue generated by ski facilities. You can see the blue line on this chart um, moves in roughly the same pattern as the green line, um, but it doesn't make sense that just because a ski, re a, a ski facility is making more money that uh, people around the country would be dying from becoming entangled in their bed sheets. So, when I see uh, a plot that shows two values that correlate with each other, I, uh, I, I call it the smell test. I, I take a look at it and it, it's a, a gut check. It's an, an instant reaction that says, this makes sense, These, this is a plausible relationship, or this doesn't make sense. There's no way uh, you're gonna convince me that, uh, that we should shut down ski revenue or ski facilities in the US as a way of preventing uh, bed sheet deaths. Uh, I, I um, encourage you when you're looking at visuals that, that tend to correlate well uh, to, to subject them to that test. So uh, the next pitfall that I want to talk about is uh, using too much color. In this case we have a, a chart showing uh, the average ranking each conference in college basketball gets when they go to the NCAA tournament. So for those of you unfamiliar with the NCAA tournament, uh, the, the best uh, 69 basketball teams in the country get in and uh, a team of uh, basketball experts ranks them from one to 16. And then the, the 16th ranked teams play the one, the, the, the number one ranked teams, 15s play twos, so on and so forth, until the best teams sort of meet in the middle and play each other for the championship. Uh, this bar chart is showing the, the typical rank, the average rank that uh, teams from each college basketball conference are given when they make the tournament. So we've got uh, this conference up here that's typically ranked really highly. They're, they're ranked uh, you know, on average 2.43. And then we've got some teams down here at the bottom that if they make the tournament at all, they're almost always number 16. Uh, they're almost always that worst rank. So the, the problem with this chart is that it uh, is twofold. Number one, uh, it's impossible to tell the difference between some of these colors just by looking at the chart. Um, I, I, uh, I challenge you to, uh, to look at this for 10 seconds and tell me the difference between the, the SWAC and the WAC uh, and, and point them out on the bar chart. Uh, it, it's very difficult to do that because they're both basically the same shade of pink. Uh, I, I, for the life of me, I can't tell them apart uh, other than that this, this legend tells me that they should be separate. The other problem with this chart is that we don't actually need the color. Uh, we know that uh, the conference that a college basketball team comes from is uh, a categorical variable. So we're using a bar chart to communicate that. There's a little uh, a little tiny gap between each of these bars. Um, and we actually don't need the, we don't need this top bar to be yellow and the next one down to be green for us to know that uh, the top bar is different from the next bar down. Um, what would be, what would make this chart better is if all the bars were the same color so that we, uh, we wouldn't get distracted by trying to tell the difference between the, the Southern and the Southland conference. Uh, and if we put, uh, a label here on the y-axis that said what these conferences actually were instead of relying on this legend to tell us. 
So the, the last pitfall I want to talk about is pie charts in general. Uh, I see pie charts a lot. Uh, they're, they're common. Uh, they're, they're sort of easy to make in Excel, but they don't effectively communicate your data. And that's, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do. We're trying to show someone a picture that they can look at and immediately tell, uh, you know, this proportion of survey respondents are male and this proportion are female. Um, if you, when you look at a pie chart, it's difficult for humans to, uh, to do that math in their head without having some sort of label on the chart itself that says what the proportions are. And uh, if you're having to look at a label that says what the proportions are, you might as well just, uh, just publish a table that says, uh, you know, this is the category name and next to it is the proportion of, of the whole that makes up that category. So uh, looking at this sort of facetious pie chart that uh, I took off of the internet, uh, we've got a portion of this, this chart that is a pie chart or pie that I've eaten and, and a proportion that's pie that I haven't eaten. Uh, if, I, if we polled everyone watching this webinar and asked you what proportion of the pie has been eaten, uh, I imagine we would get uh, guesstimates ranging anywhere from uh, maybe 27 to 35% of this pie. And uh, I couldn't blame you for, for making that, that estimate. Uh, I, I don't know the true answer because, uh, you know, obviously this isn't an actual data visualization, uh, but also it's not clear what the, what the true answer is. So uh, I implore you, whenever you're thinking about making a pie chart to show the, uh, uh, a measure of uh, how many observations fall into each category of a categorical variable, uh, I, would, I, I urge you to think back to uh, the chart that we talked about that's good for presenting one categorical variable, and that's the bar chart. It's, it's easier to uh, tell the difference between what the measures are uh, and, and it's sort of easier to look at it once and, and tell what you're looking at. So uh, let's move on to things you can do to, to improve your, your data visualization. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about these in the context of uh, this example chart uh, to the right, the, the top 10 overrated and underrated teams in college basketball from the first uh, 15 years of, of the, the 21st century. So. Now, uh, what we're looking at here is uh, on the x-axis, we've got some measure of the number of NCAA tournament games played by each team compared to the number that they were expected to play. Uh, the way that's calculated for, for background is uh, a, a number one team is, is ranked number one because they're expected to get to the final four. A number two team is expected to get to uh, the round before that. Uh, and a number of three team is expected to get to the round before that, uh, and so on and so forth. A number 16 team, uh, conversely, is expected to lose in the first round because they're matched up against a number one team uh, that the, the selection committee has decided is better. So uh, if we're looking at this chart, we can see that uh, Kansas is consistently ranked really highly, but they exit the tournament early, so they play fewer games than they're expected to in the tournament. Whereas Butler tends to be ranked lower, and they go farther in the tournament than, than their seed, their ranking would suggest they should go. So let's talk about why, uh, why I think this chart is good at, at communicating that metric. Um, the, the first thing is that it has a title that's descriptive. Uh, we're, we're looking at the top 10 best teams and the bottom 10 worst teams according to this metric. And uh, that's exactly what the, the chart says. Top 10 most overrated and underrated teams uh, between 2001 and 2016. Um, if you give someone a chart with a, a title that um, sort of helps them get started with their analysis of your work, uh, it, it just primes their, uh, their response to to uh, more effectively grasp what you're trying to tell them. Uh, the second point here is to label your axes uh, or don't, but make sure you're appropriately labeling your axes. Uh, in this case, the x-axis is labeled. We've got this label that says games played relative to expectations since 2001, but the y-axis is not labeled. Uh, and the reason for that is 
if I just showed you this chart that had a bunch of numbers down here that went from negative 20 to positive 10, uh, that could mean anything. Maybe I'm trying to communicate that uh, Kansas has lost 23 games more than they've won. Um, maybe this is looking at uh, scores of, of college basketball games and saying that Kansas was outscored by their opponents by 23 points. Uh, without that axis label, that numeric variable doesn't make sense. However, on the y-axis, we're looking at uh, names of obvious schools. So uh, we're looking at Duke. Duke is a, a college. Uh, Duke is a well-known college. Same with Georgetown and Wake Forest and Stanford. Um, I, I don't think it's necessary to put a piece of text on the y-axis that says, hey, these are colleges. So uh, be judicious in the way that you apply uh, ink to your chart. Um, if you think that an axis needs a label to be understood, then do it. Uh, if you think an axis is self-explanatory, then uh, I think that that extra ink makes it harder to, to uh, makes it easier to get distracted and therefore harder to conduct your analysis. Going along that theme of avoiding extra ink, um, you should avoid uh, grid lines or make them light if you have to use them at all. And what I mean by grid lines is sometimes you'll, you'll see a plot that has, uh, has a, a, a dotted line that goes sort of up and up and up at a certain measure, at a certain interval on the x-axis, and it goes horizontally on the y-axis. Uh, if you open up an Excel file, uh, most of the view that you see is grid lines. Each cell has a little uh, box around it that delineates the, the outline of that cell. Um, Similar to axis labels, unless you actually need a grid line, they are, uh, it's just an extra thing for someone to look at when they're looking at the data that you're presenting. So when I'm showing this chart, I want this metric to be the, the outstanding uh, visual element. I want the first thing you look at to, to be this metric. And uh, I, I also want it to be sort of easily associated with the, the, uh, the school that it is associated with. Uh, if I were to add grid lines, that's just extra stuff for uh, a viewer to look at that doesn't necessarily help either of those goals. Um, but thinking about annotations, uh, which I, I think are, uh, a grid line can be a form of annotation, um, but an annotation can also be text. This is another form of ink that can be helpful or or hurtful depending on whether or not it's actually necessary. So uh, this chart has three annotations on it. It's got this text here that says top 10 overperformers. It's got this text down here that says bottom 10 underperformers. And then it's got this dotted line going across the middle uh, where we flip from our 10 overperformers to our 10 underperformers. Now, I could have split this chart into two charts uh, like we talked about earlier, and just had a whole separate plot for overperformers and a whole separate plot for underperformers. But uh, I think it's, it's a little more efficient in this case uh, to display this data the way it is. And this annotation, this dotted line here, uh, indicates that there's some sort of break between these top values and these bottom values, which is good because there's 350 college basketball teams and there's 20 presented on this chart. So there are a bunch of teams that fall uh, in between Connecticut and Stanford, and that blue dotted line uh, demonstrates that, that sort of break. Um, and then the, the last point I'll make here, just a, a uh, well, the last two points, just a, a general point on uh, ink uh, is that every design feature you add, everything that you put on your chart should have some, fee, uh, some point. It, uh, it, it should aid in the analysis of the data that you're presenting. So if I had, uh, if I had a bunch of text up here in this blank space that said, uh, that described maybe the method that I use to collect this data, um, I don't necessarily think that's necessary for understanding the data that's presented here. Or maybe I had some text that presents analysis of this chart um, that, that uh, isn't appropriate to go there, and it would distract from the uh, from the point of the chart, which is 
to give you the data and let you analyze it. Um, whereas these other annotations I've added have clear purposes. Uh, I wanted to label the top 10 overperforming schools. Uh, I wanted to have this axis label that describes what these numbers across the bottom of the screen mean. Uh, so the, the point here is to be judicious when you're adding things to your visuals. Uh, and then the last point I'll make, I think this is important for professional development. It's also important if you're on a team working on a project or uh, you're working for a federal agency that needs to present uh, proof to the citizens uh, that fund your projects that your projects are, are working well. Maybe that's why you're making a data visualization. Um, I think it's important to develop a theme and stick to it with your visuals. Uh, a theme element can be anything from the, the variety of colors you use to the font you use to, uh, for your text, the background color uh, of your plots, uh, choices like whether or not to use grid lines are, are thematic choices. Uh, but the, the point is when you pick a theme, stick to it so that when, uh, you, know, when you present a, a really great visual to someone that communicates your data really well and really accurately, uh, that person's going to remember uh, that you're a competent uh, data analyst and next time they come back to you, if you can hand them something that sort of looks similar to the last thing they saw, uh, I think they're more likely to, uh, to take that visual seriously. Uh, this is something that I work a lot on in my personal life, uh, professionally. Um, I, I want to make sure that uh, first, I want to make sure I'm doing a good job of accurately and effectively communicating data. Uh, but then I want to make sure that uh, the next time I go back to a person and present an analysis, uh, the reputation that I work to build for being an accurate data analyst uh, carries forward. And one way to do that is to, to stick to a visual theme. So, uh, that was a lot of uh, a lot of pitfalls, a lot of tips for for how to do better. Um, to uh, let, let's go ahead and recap the uh, the the webinar, and uh, then I'll hand it over to Vicky for for some questions. Uh, so the first thing we talked about was graphs versus infographics versus dashboards. Uh, again, a graph is sort of communicating one point at a time. Uh, an infographic is a collection of graphs that tell a story in a static way, maybe with some uh, supplementary text or pictures that are not necessarily data visualizations. Um, and then a dashboard tends to be mostly data visualizations that have some dynamic element to it, either uh, enabling a user to filter the data that they're working with or update it over time, um, or maybe you know, otherwise transform or change the data they're looking at to aid in their own analysis. Uh, we also talked about discrete versus continuous data and some different types of charts to use when you have uh, discrete data or continuous data or some combination of both. Um, and then lastly, we talked about uh, pitfalls like using too much color in a graph or uh, using pie charts to, to communicate uh, distributions of discrete data um, and, and some things that you can do well, like uh, um, like making sure you're sticking to a visual theme uh, and being judicious about uh, what visual elements you add to your graphs. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to hand things back over to Vicki. Vicki, do, do you have any questions you want to talk through a little more in depth? I have a couple of questions for you, Josh. That was awesome. What a tremendous amount of information and, and work you put into that for us. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to just touch on something you, you just talked about, and that's the, the developing a consistent visual theme throughout your work, because really what you're doing here is branding yourself as a data analyst, right? What other tips can you give around that for people who are, you know, taking this seriously as part of their career? Uh, I, absolutely. So one thing that my, my visual theme has sort of uh, evolved over the last year as I've sort of picked up some tips and tricks on how to better communicate data. Um, but I think one thing that I try to do is be really intentional about making any sort of changes to the way I present information. So, and, and doing the, doing, making those changes slowly. So I'm not going to uh, come into work tomorrow and have a, an entirely different color scheme for my analysis. Um, I might sort of start introducing uh, different colors uh, slowly and then transition 
uh, transition slowly that way. Um, I also consume a lot of data visuals and pick what I like and what I don't like. Uh, one of my favorite sources of data visualization, and I think if you look at my theme, I've adopted a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff from them is 538. Um, I think they do a really great job of visualizing, uh, visualizing data. I really like their, the gray backgrounds on their chart, which I have uh, adopted. Um, I like the way that they sort of um, make the, the points on their scatter plots translucent so that you can sort of see overlap better and I've adopted that. So I think those two points sort of being very intentional and cautious about making changes um, and also uh, sort of casting a wide net and looking around at the world of data visualization um, and picking out what you like and don't like uh, are, are two things that you can do to, to sort of develop that theme. Right. I'm guessing also that when you're working with the same client over and over, just presenting new information, it's also easier for them to digest that if you're consistent about the, the look and the feel. Right. Yeah. And, and uh, the, the audience for, for this webinar is, is federal employees. Your, uh, your client is uh, the American people or maybe it's Congress or, uh, you know, your, your boss who's making funding decisions for your projects. Uh, and if you can be consistent uh, in, in presenting the way that your projects are moving forward, I think that goes a long way in sort of building trust and uh, building a sense that you know what you're doing and, and you're worthy of, uh, of further investment of time and resources. Right, right. So I want to go back to something you talked about earlier because infographics pop up everywhere now, <laughs> but it seems from listening to you that as popular as they are, they're not necessarily the best way to present data because they're, they're very non-dynamic. Um, you recommend interactive dashboards over inf infographics. Can you just elaborate a little more on that uh, and where we might want to use infographics? Sure. So uh, I think part of this is, is uh, you know, the way uh, popular trends in data analysis are, are sort of trending towards, uh, towards interactive, interactivity as a, a way that people, you know, want to consume data. Um, I think the reason that I particularly like dashboards is that uh, you're sort of, you're, you're doing the setup work of uh, collecting and aggregating a lot of data and sort of guiding someone towards a decision that uh, you think is best based on the data that you're presenting. Uh, but then you're, you're letting them sort of explore and immerse themselves in the data uh, without necessarily having to, to come to you and, and get like an edict of this is exactly what the data means, uh, this is how you should interpret it, and this is the decision you should make based off of that. You can sort of guide someone to a decision and then let them play around with the data themselves and, and draw the conclusion that, uh, that is, is best. Yeah, um, makes sense. Yeah, and, and then to, to answer your second question about where an infographic might be better, um, I think areas where uh, your audience, where areas where there's a high barrier to entry for understanding information. Uh, so if you're working in a, a very uh, esoteric field of agriculture, you're going to Congress asking for funding for some project uh, that the, the member of Congress you're talking to uh, might not understand the intricacies of, of uh, the work you're doing. I think in that case, having a more static set of visuals uh, can be better because uh, that person needs more guidance in making that decision. Uh, so my sort of philosophy in life is to give people information and trust them to make the right decisions. But there are instances where, uh, where someone doesn't have all the information they need to make a decision, or you know, maybe you have a PhD in a field uh, and you're you know, the, the preeminent authority on that topic. Uh, and you really need to explain, uh, explain what you're talking about very thoroughly. And, th and in that case, a set of graphs or infographics could be better. Okay, makes sense, makes sense, Josh. And so one last question for you. You mentioned one of the resources that you like to uh, go to and, and get inspiration from. Do you have any others that you'd recommend? Yeah, so the, the Upshot at the New York Times, the, it's a, a um, data journalism uh, blog associated with the New York Times. They do a lot of really great data visualization. Uh, the Washington Post does some great data visualization. There are websites like flowingdata.com uh, and, and there's a, 
a subreddit on uh, on Reddit called Data is Beautiful, where people sort of upload and critique each other's uh, each other's data visualizations. All of these are, are sort of sources of, uh, of good and bad visuals that I go to frequently to uh, either learn more about a topic or uh, just sort of get a better idea of what people are doing in, in, the, in the world of data visualization. Awesome. Thank you so much. Josh Yasmin, thank you so much. I, I said at the top of the hour how busy you are. I mean, you, you're working as a data analyst with Slate Group. You are also studying for your master's. You're the advocacy chair for the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network and still take time out to do this. So truly, we very much appreciate it. On behalf of Aquan, thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, just very quickly as we head out here, I'd like to share just a few of Aquant's uh, uh, Aquant Federal's government clients. They've worked with these for many, many, many years. And if you have any questions about um, today's webcast uh, in general, not about data visualization, Josh is the person for that, <laughs> but the webcast in general, or you have any questions about um, Aquant Federal, you can call Lee Andries. If you could just shunt me forward one more time, Josh, please. Thank you so much. And this is Lee Andries. She's vice president of Aquant Federal. And her contact information is here. And I know both uh, Josh and Lee would love to hear from you. So thanks everyone for, uh, for joining us and uh, we'll catch you next time.